Well, I'm from University College London, and when they eventually get around to firing me, if I were to apply for a post at the United Nations, I know what they would say. Oh, no, not him. <laughs> However, on that basis, I can at least give a fully independent assessment. Whether you think it's a good one or not is entirely up to you of the actions of the United Nations with respect to developing a global agenda for disaster reduction. In this presentation, many of the background photographs come from the Japanese tsunami. Uh, the agreement, the Sendai framework, was of course made in the nearest big university to the tsunami area, namely Tohoku University, with which my university is twinned, and hence I thought it appropriate to include some of the images of the event that sort of stimulated the, at least the decision to hold the meeting, the crucial meeting, in Sendai, in the area, uh, if not the agenda itself. Well, there was a point in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s even, when confronted with the apparent rise in the effect of disasters, somebody said, well, this is the age of disaster management. Note that there was then no emphasis or no large emphasis on disaster reduction. It was managing the event, but something had to be done. Those curves, they were going up. By the way, part of that is illusory, but nevertheless, there is an increase. The world population is going up. When I was born, there were 2.6 billion people. Now there are nearly three times as many. Well, you may just argue that shows how old I am. However, <laughs> nevertheless, in 1984, at the four-year meeting of the seismological community in San Francisco, the eighth World Conference on Earthquake Engineering, <coughs> the president of the US National Academy of Sciences, Frank Press, proposed a decade of monitoring earthquakes, where they would try to join up the efforts being made to monitor seismic activity between different countries and regions. And the reason was they did not have a world network and they were concerned that they were losing data because it was all only regionalized. And by the way, the network was entirely dependent on funding to monitor the other side's nuclear explosions, underground nuclear explosions. It had nothing to do with monitoring earthquakes that kill people naturally generated earthquakes. Anyway, that was taken to the United Nations to give it legitimacy. And in debate in the General Assembly in New York, many delegates representing countries from the poorer parts of the world said, we do not want yet more application of technology for abstruse reasons. What we want is something that aims towards development and so they subtly changed the emphasis from technological monitoring of hazard towards vulnerability assessment because it was gradually being recognized that vulnerability is the essence of disaster. And development is being set back by disaster vulnerability. Indeed it is. So in June 1990, under UN auspices, the International Decade for Natural Disaster Reduction begins. Three years previously, a prospectus was issued by the United States government that said, rather autonomously, that's to say the US, the US devised the agenda, the prospectus said that the objective of the decade was to halve the impact of disasters in 10 years. Absolutely impossible, but anyway. That's what they said. Nevertheless, 140 nations at least set up a committee. Now, we have to remember what the writer Mark Twain said. 
here. He said, whenever I don't feel like doing anything, I go to a committee meeting. <laughs> However, some of this did lead to actual action. There were, for example, five international projects, one, for example, RADIUS, for the reduction of urban seismic risk in selected metropolitan cities. And there were strategic conferences, for example, 1995 Yokohama. Interesting that it should always be Japan, but Japan, in hazards terms, is the most vulnerable country in the world, although not necessarily in vulnerability terms. So there we were in the midst of the world decade. When it ended, the success was evaluated and found to be limited, quite honestly. Not much was said about this because negative conclusions don't help. Nevertheless, the death toll in disasters were kept fairly constant. That was something. Population is rocketing, but disaster death toll was fairly constant. Bear in mind that in Burkina Faso in this period, the population doubling time was 19 years. And to have the same disaster death toll, you had to halve it 19 years in 10 years. Uh, sorry, uh, what am I saying? Double in 19 years. Uh, so what that meant was to have the same death toll in less than two decades, you had to halve the death toll because the population would double. You see what I mean? I hope that's not hopelessly opaque. Anyway, anyway the decade definitely increased the amount the quality and the level of international collaboration about disaster reduction. It started governments thinking about it, and I refer to governments that had not thought about it. It became top of the agenda in places like Indonesia, at least when they weren't engaged in civil war. It was top of the agenda, and that was told to me by one of the cabinet ministers. And for once, I believe him. So, what to do after the decade? There it is petering out in the year 2000, and the UN therefore decides that it will consolidate the Secretariat and it will make a permanent organism within the UN structure based in Geneva, the International Strategy for Disaster Reduction. And we are moving towards the idea that vulnerability really is the problem rather than hazard, slowly but steadily. So as the decade ended, plans were laid to form the ISDR. It is a small agency by UN standards. It is certainly nothing of the size of the World Food Programme, uh, the High Commission for Refugees, or OCHA, which is in some ways the sister organisation, the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, formerly UNDRO the Office of the United Nations Disaster Relief Coordinator. Smaller than all of that, it does not pay for disaster reduction. You cannot go to ISDR and say, look, we've got this great idea, can you finance it for us? They won't. They barely cover their own needs. But it does advise and evaluate, as well as developing a strategy, regional and above all global, to try to get the problem of disasters under control. So we enter, not only because of this, but nevertheless, we enter the age of disaster risk reduction. We're trying to put a positive spin on the idea of doing something about disasters. No longer is it clearing up the mess. Instead, now, it's positive action to try to stop the mess happening in the first place. Well, disasters are anthropogenic. This is a realization that has taken place. In other words, people cause disasters, not earthquakes, volcanoes, and so on. Vulnerability is it. You can have a massive earthquake in the middle of Siberia and no casualties. You can have gigantic landslides in the center of Alaska and no casualties. So it is very much vulnerability. And that very slowly was realized. So there was a huge battle to shift the emphasis from reacting to disasters as and after they had occurred, 
to doing something preventative before. We know a great deal about where and when disasters will occur. We may not predict them exactly, but we know the disaster prone areas very well indeed. The problem with this is that if you have a set amount of money to spend, you've still got to spend it on reacting. You can't say, oh no, I'm sorry, we will not save people who risk dying because we've already spent the money on failed mitigation. You have to spend it and that is that. Politicians know this well. So the unfortunate problem here is that we need extra money to spend on mitigation. It may be very valid. Estimates of how valid are highly varied from um, you spend one euro and you save four to you spend one euro and you save 139. It depends on the circumstances, but more than that, it depends on the assumptions that you make when you do so. So what is the difference? How, did the decade, uh, how is the decade different from the strategy that followed it? Well, the natural has gone from disaster for a start. The idea of natural disaster is, okay, you had a natural trigger, but we now know very well that there isn't a great deal that is natural about disasters. And that also implies natural disaster. We can't do anything about it. Well, we can. There is a reaction, uh, or rather a shift from reaction to preparedness, but it is rather small. And that is because of the problem I have just outlined. And then we get, every two years, a conference in Geneva and global assessment reports. If you look on the web somewhere, you can find a picture of me asleep in the conference hall in Geneva <laughs> with my head back and my mouth open taken by a malicious colleague from a British <coughs> university uh, during a speech by Ban Ki-moon, who was then the Secretary General of the United Nations. Anyway, um, in 1995, at the heart of the decade, in Hyogo Prefecture, um, Japan, along comes the Kobe earthquake, as it is sometimes known, the Hyogo or Kobe earthquake, uh, 534 urban fires, 6,330 dead, a big event where a small one was expected. The calculations were wrong because most seismic zonation is based on what has happened before, and if you haven't got the records, you simply don't know, and that's how it was at Hyogo. But they held the conference there. And, of course, it gave rise to the Hyogo Framework for Action, a 10-year program in which the UN urged countries all over the world, all countries, because no country is free of disaster, to do something about it. And they made it simple, or at least they made it sound simple. <laughs> priority actions, there were five. Ensure that this is a priority in your country. In other words, stop marginalising disasters, stop saying, well, we've got an economic crisis, disasters can wait till later. They can't. Well, indeed they can't. Institutional basis for implementation, not only found a committee, but have a proper structure, a national ministry or department or something that will then cause this to filter down to the local level by creating a complete national structure. Number two, work out what the risks are. Countries have different risk profiles, but no country is free of risk. Therefore, it is necessary to know what at least can be known about the recurrence, the frequency, the magnitude of disasters, the nature of vulnerability, and hence the likelihood of impacts. Thirdly, Use knowledge and education, build a culture of safety. Great idea. To an extent it is being done, and to an extent it was even done in the 1990s. And that is ramping up, it is increasing, although rather slowly. Fourthly, reduce the risks. Is that happening? I have my doubts. Well, of course there are plenty of examples where it is happening, but overall, is risk going up? or is it going down? A colleague, Terry Cannon, proposes the cure to damage ratio. He says that for climate change it is one to a thousand. 
What he means is that in climate change amelioration or adaptation, when we spend one dollar on reducing the problem or the risk, we spend one thousand dollar on things like substitute uh, uh, subsidies for fossil fuel production and making the problem worse. I recently saw a report which suggested that regarding disasters, the ratio, the cure to damage ratio is 1 to 46. Now you can take that or leave it because it all depends how you calculate it. But the implication is if you believe that, that for every 1 euro we spend on reducing disasters, we spend 46 euros on creating them. Anyway, number five, strength and preparedness and response. So at least, you know, it's necessary to respond. We cannot, even if we're brilliant at risk reduction, stop things happening. So we've got to be able to respond well. Okay, knowledge, preparedness and action will reduce losses. Uh, we hope, maybe, who knows. So how do we implement this? We need, firstly, to connect that agenda, those five points, to, for example, Agenda 21 of the UN Conference on Environment and Convention on Environment and Development. The agenda started in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. In other words, development and the preservation of the environment that sustains, supports and enables development has got to link up to the disasters agenda because disasters destroy development and the environment. Okay, good idea. And at the local level. At last, somebody's looked at the local level rather than the global. And the Millennium Development Goals, which to some extent have supplanted the earlier agenda. And the Sustainable Development Goals that have supplanted the Millennium Development Goals, and so it goes on and on. Think how much paper this involves. I know it's all supposed to be electronic now, but nevertheless, they actually do print this stuff. By the way, when we get to the Sendai conference, I calculated using internet sources that the Sendai conference on disaster reduction <coughs> probably used up about 15,000 tons of, produced 15,000 tons of carbon dioxide. The conference. Anyway. And also a Safe Cities initiative was founded. More about that in just a moment. But what was wrong, what is wrong, what was wrong with the Yogo Framework for Action? What were its deficiencies? Well, firstly, <coughs> non-binding. Take it or leave it. If you don't want to do it and you're the Prime Minister, well, nobody can do anything to you. You can waggle the finger and say, look, uh, Philippines, or look, uh, Tonga, you haven't done this or Vanuatu, you haven't done this, or, or, or United Kingdom, or wherever. Uh, but there's nothing they can do to police it. Secondly, key elements were missing. Uh, myself and one or two others had a campaign against ISDR saying, look, you are ignoring some things and there are no-go areas. You don't talk about corruption. Uh, you, in the Kyoko framework, they didn't talk about gender. Goodness me, what in this day and age? They didn't talk about human rights. And they said little or nothing about minorities. Well, okay, it was a first effort to have an international sort of treaty. But nevertheless, uh, these things become bigger and bigger issues as we know more about them. The Kyogo framework was vague about how to do it. You must do this, you must do that, you must do five things, but how, how, how? And really it didn't attack the causes. Indeed, it's very difficult to attack the causes because you could argue that one of the leading causes is disaster capitalism. So indeed, were there no-go areas? Were, for example, corruption and gender and human rights, areas where the UN would just stop talking, just exclude them. They vigorously said no. And the leader of ISDR wrote to me and said, there is absolutely no way that we won't talk about these. Just didn't see them doing it. So, deficiencies of the UN process. Firstly, non-binding agreements are non-binding, therefore, what incentive is there to apply them? 
there is no legal mechanism that can force people to reduce the impact of disasters or force governments. This is an issue, this is a problem, and I have seen it in the raw. And where I saw it personally was the signing of the Safe Cities Initiative by the Deputy Mayor of Tehran. When this happened in Davos in Switzerland, I was sitting in the third row of the audience, everyone else in that row was Iranian, and they were weeping. Why? Because the deputy mayor, until two months previously, had been the chief of police, and several of my colleagues there had <coughs> dossiers, large, complete dossiers of murder committed by the police, for which he personally was responsible. Suddenly, uh, this person, who some would regard as mass murderer, is the great international diplomat signing the agreement, the handshakes, the smiles for the camera, the hold up the document, the great peacemaker. And that could happen at home and abroad, and the photographs taken in Switzerland then go back to the country of origin, and everyone says, oh look, what a wonderful peacemaker. The other point of great importance is that disaster risk reduction doesn't necessarily work as a top-down process. We cannot really start in Geneva and expect a village on the coast to benefit from that. More about that in a moment, though, because it's an important point. The UN process tends to collect evidence, but it doesn't do so in a blanket, objective, unbiased sort of way, in my opinion. This is my opinion. Instead, it tends to do it selectively in a way that rather enhances the process. Oh, look at the progress we're making. Well, at one meeting of this kind, they finished so early because they talked about nothing but progress, and actually there wasn't much, that they said, the microphone is open, anyone want to make a statement? I marched up to the front and grabbed the microphone and said, um, right, you've talked about progress, now we will talk about retrogress, going backwards. I gave them blow by blow what was happening in L'Aquila in central Italy. All sorts of bad things. We haven't time to go into that, but anyway. Accountability is the root of that, and it's the root of many things. That is to say, who should we hold to account and how can we do it? No legal mechanism. If they don't do what they should do, or if they do it wrong, or if they use this as an excuse to exploit, how can we actually stop that? Good question. Okay, well there are some other initiatives. On the research front, for example, the World Bank with the UN finance, the Global Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction, and it produces some good work. This, in turn, funds the other IRDR, it's the name, it's the initials of my institute, we got there first, a year later they founded this in Beijing, in China, the Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, which is proposing the forensic investigation methodology, and actually IRDR has gone over, it's stopped talking about disaster risk reduction, and it now is focusing on disaster risk creation. Well, good for them. I was one of the first to use the foreign methodology in a published paper, which was the one I wrote on the um, similarities between the Costa Concordia, the world's most expensive shipwreck ever, and the sinking of the Titanic. And they were quite remarkable, uncanny, unearthly similarities. Anyway, the other uh, thing that was done, but not by the UN, crucially, was that a large collection of non-governmental organizations, the Global Network of Civil Society Organizations for Disaster Reduction, based in Twickenham, London, UK, put out two reports, one of which was called Clouds But Little Rain. What did they do? Well, they collected 21,500 questionnaires from local people, authorities, and goodness knows who, to ask, well, the Hyogo framework, um, does it work? What Hyogo framework was the answer? In essence, what they found in their two reports was that the impact at the front line was very small, very small. In other words, the top-down process stops before it gets to the bottom, was what they were finding. 
So to counter that, along comes the UN initiative for cities, making cities resilient, the Safe Cities Initiative, great. 2010, 2009, they get this underway, they crank it up and it starts off. Now, nearly 3,000 cities are, or towns or villages are members of this. How many urban settlements are there in the world? My estimate is about a million. Uh, but anyway, 3,000 of them have joined up, which is something. Ten-point action plan, all sensible stuff. A bit hard to apply in Tegucigalpa, Guatemala, where the murder rate is, uh, well, it was the highest in the world, although that's really San Salvador now, El Salvador. <coughs> Conferences of mayors, they get together, they exchange ideas, all good stuff, good idea. Field assessment and implementation, another great idea. Get it to reality, tie it to reality. Sign up for the initiative, get more settlements to sign up. 47 of the villages of Basilicata signed up. Basilicata is the forgotten region of southern Italy. I know it well, I did 15 years research there. Nobody else did. It was a solitary experience. But now 47 towns are signed up to the Safe Cities Initiative. Wow. <laughs> okay, safe schools, safe health facilities, just what we need, definitely. But let's take the case of Venice. And this is what it says in the report. There is Venice. Join the Safe Cities campaign as a role model, a beacon city for cultural heritage protection, climate change adaptation. Oh wow, Venice is it. So there it is, St Mark Square Venice on the uh, cover of the 2013 brochure for the Safe Cities Initiative. Great. So let's go to Venice, walk around the streets, and what do we see? Well, this. No, it is not photoshopped. No, it is not a montage. It is real. Uh, Venice now has put in place a special program to stop this. Now, they only allow cruise ships of 96,000 tonnes down the Grand Canal. 96,000 tonnes is 11 storeys high, by the way. So cruise ships, even bigger than 96,000 tonnes, were going down the Grand Canal one metre away from the historic fabric of the city. The slightest mistake, you have damage. If it leads to something like a ship capsizing, well, forget it. Uh, what's the plan? Well, there is a plan instead to use the old oil tanker route, uh, dredge it out, and then get to the cruise ship terminal without going down the Grand Canal. Great. Ecologists tell us that this will devastate the ecology of the lagoon, lagoon which is very fragile. Right, uh, yes, Beacon City, uh, role model. Let's all be like Venice. Oh, and by the way, at the time that came out, uh, the mayor of Venice was in the process of being uh, indicted for corruption as a result of money spent on the flood defences, Mose, the Moses uh, swing up flood defences for the recruit. Yeah. Anyway, the action plan was there, and uh, providing you've got all of these, it will work. You need money, you need democracy, transparency, enlightenment, planning and implementation. That's all you need. You know, just a few things. Uh, so there we are. If you've got all of that, you're lucky. Well, places do have it. Tokyo has got it, for example. <coughs> Tokyo is, by some counts, the most vulnerable city in the world. It's got massive fire, earthquake, flood, landslide, tsunami related problems. And it's got possibly the world's most dangerous seismic fault zone off the coast with high likelihood in the short term of another magnitude 9 earthquake. In other words, if you're talking about the Richter scale, it will be off the Richter scale. We don't use the Richter scale anymore. It wouldn't register it. So, but anyway, Tokyo has got its act together quite well, really. But Tokyo is a rich city, isn't it? Is the same true for Jakarta or Manila or uh, Buenos Aires or somewhere? Well, maybe if they haven't got the money, we can um, use international aid. I took this picture, Typhoon Yolanda, emergency response on the beach in Tacloban in the Philippines. Unfortunately, it was almost the only evidence I could find of UK aid, except for a Land Rover 
Well, if it had been any other country, it would have been a Toyota Land Cruiser, but it had to be a Land Rover. We had two very self-important people inside it. That was the only other evidence I could find in the entire area of UK aid. Hmm. Anyway, what is aid? Is it a good thing? That's a good question. What is aid? Well, it's um, resources that debilitate local coping capacity, which is, according to our evaluation, four months after Typhoon Yolanda Haiyang, more or less what happened in uh, eastern Visayas, Philippines. You don't agree? Sorry, I've just done my PhD on exactly this recovery, so uh -huh. I've got the following years. Please tell me if I'm wrong. I could well be completely <laughs> wrong. So, uh, any any great We will have the very time. That's for sure. You can you can hack me to pieces. Uh, what is aid? Well, it's munitions, military hardware, soldier training, and of course a little bit of humanitarian stuff. They had to change the colour of humanitarian rations. They fell out of the sky. They were the same colour as cluster bombs. <laughs> And now they're pink, cluster bombs tend to be yellow or colourless, sort of metal colour, green even. Um, but, but essentially, if you look at the arms trade, it suffered no recession and it is now booming like never before. Now, if you want to invest some money, go and invest it in the arms trade. It's by far the best thing you could do. Of course, totally unethical. But uh, if you want money for your money, the arms trade. Uh, humanitarian aid is an instrument of political influence, clearly, obviously. You can see it by taking any disaster and see who donated most. And it will give you the map of political connections every time. It is a means of lining certain people's pockets. While not all emergencies involve massive loss of funds, most of them involve about 10% or so. But where does it go? Um, if you read the work of Linda Polman, a Dutch journalist, she wrote, for example, The Crisis Caravan, where she went to Rwanda, uh, Ethiopia, and um, Afghanistan, and looked at the aid circus, the great international industry, the machine of humanitarian aid. And where did it go? To whom did it go? And it rather tended to reinforce certain mechanisms of hegemony or of power control, uh, bearing in mind also what Roberto Saviano called the Kalashnikov culture. Roberto Saviano, Italian journalist with a 24-hour police guard, actually went and had tea with Anton Kalashnikov, now the late, uh, to discuss this with him. It's uh, very interesting to read his book Gomorrah on the Kalashnikov culture, but it is somewhat fueled by the aid industry. Uh, as it happens. Not all aid is bad, of course it isn't, much of it is very good, but there are distinct problems with aid in this respect. And what about human rights? They of course go with all of this, so there is an increasing realisation, including among scholar lawyers, that human rights are fundamental because they guarantee you some degree of access to information, which otherwise you might not have, and some degree of ability to act to protect yourself if no one else will do it. So, desire or restriction of access to information, lack of autonomy, self-determination, therefore inability to make decisions about safety. Someone else must do it or not. <coughs> and of course all the vulnerability problems associated with violence in its many forms that are associated with human rights violations. Forced migration. Now, of all places, that occurred in the United States after Hurricane Katrina and was studied by the anthropologist Tony Oliver Smith. And of course, corruption, inequality, justice, injustice, and so on. So, okay, what about gender? What is the role of gender in all of this? Well, if we look at the Kobe earthquake, and perhaps I could have chosen a more recent one, but anyone will do, we find that more women died than men did in every category. We have to rather adjust that in old age, because in Japan, in old age, there are twice as many women alive as there are men. But nevertheless, there is clear indication of victimization. <coughs> Everything we know about this, and we now know more and more, as indeed we should do, suggests that women have a much higher burden to bear internationally, well, inter locally, but 
uh, around the world in terms of uh, their, their, uh, the impact of disaster on them before, during and after. So gender is a major factor and its submission from the Yoga framework was a glaring abnormality. So what is the world actually like? And this is bad government by Ambrogio Ronizetti in the uh, town hall. Uh, um, Palazzo Pubblico in Siena. I actually got married in this building, although not actually in this room. Uh, the good thing, of course, is that good government's on the other wall, but anyway, it's bad government. We live in a world in which 43, you know, a busload of people own half of the world's riches, which means that you know, a year and a half ago we were in Geneva discussing, thousands of us, discussing how to apply science to disaster risk reduction. When the biennial Oxfam report comes out and says the number of people who own half of the world's wealth, as much as three and a half billion other people, has gone down from 62 to 43. And nobody said anything except me. Nobody much listens to me, so it didn't have much effect. So anyway, I, I did at least. Most of these problems are solvable. Many of them are easily solvable. Why, therefore, are they not solved? That is what we need to address. That's what matters. Not how to solve them. Why aren't they solved? But this all bears down on what is rational. Now, as a scientist, I was taught that there is only one rationality. We are out to find objective truth. The older I get, the more I think there are all sorts of rationalities, all sorts of truths, all sorts of objectivities. Mine is one kind, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone else's rationality is the real one. Uh, for example, I was giving a talk about disaster reduction at a conference attended by hard scientists, and I talked about risk perception a bit. And one of them said, well, it's easy, you know. If you have to spend more on risk uh, reduction than you get in reduced risk, then it's not worth doing. But if you spend more, spend more money on it and this disproportionately reduces the risk it's worth. Well, I knew that, of course, but it's not true. Because risk perception radically changes how much you have to spend or might not spend. For example, in the UK, we had a train crash. It led to absolute chaos on the national railways due to risk aversion. And everyone said, well, we must introduce everywhere immediately European train control system. Uh, European Train Protection System, which is sophisticated electronic system. Calculations suggest that this would have saved 3.52 lives per decade. Possibly worth saving, but a cost of something like 50 billion euros perhaps not worth, compared to how you could spend that money on other things. But the real factor there is that if people perceive trains to be too dangerous, they don't travel by them, they don't buy the ticket, the revenue goes down, the money to spend on improvements isn't there. And this is why that simple scientific rationality is bunkum, it doesn't work. Anyway, the activities are not legitimate, some of them anyway. Reality. Governments are not necessarily good at DRR, and they don't necessarily care about it. They may say they do, but they have to prove it. Power structures determine disaster. Read Naomi Klein and um, Anthony Lowenstein on disaster capitalism. You see it very clearly. It's the sort of uh, latter-day Chomsky approach. Evidence and research are seldom actually used for policy action. Uh, one of the great glaring examples is migration policy in the UK that led to this current desperate situation with Brexit, where in fact the government suppressed the evidence rather than using it. They commissioned the report, they insisted twice that it be um, rewritten, because the evidence showed that migration was a very positive thing for people, for the economy, for just about everything. And so they buried it, never published it. And that's how they use research. Well, I hope not, but it was in that case. Again, we're back to rationality. Whose rationality? It was a political rationality and not mine. So if we take another example, namely earthquakes, what causes earthquake disasters? In my view, this is it. In order of importance, number one, corruption. Number two, political decision-making. Number three, 
shoddy building, some of which is deliberate, some of which is not accidental. Ignorance, some of which is deliberate, failure to learn by people who don't want to learn or who simply don't realise or can't. And the least important factor is seismicity, you know, earthquakes. Now, why should I say this? So this is surely you know, off the scale, is this radical, or is it? This building, for example, collapsed. The maternity wing killed the mothers, babies, doctors and nurses. And that is because it was built on the basis of corruption. But it isn't just a single building. There are two studies which suggest on the basis of a pretty robust correlation analysis that earthquakes, in fact, are the least important factor and corruption is the most important factor. And there's further work by Escaleras, Monica Escaleras, come out a few weeks ago that further emphasizes this. Believe it or not, it's correlation, it's not causality, but it does imply strongly causality. What we have is the corruption perceptions index. And they go around to businessmen and say, well, do you think Indonesia is corrupt? And what do you rate China as? And so on. OK. And that's the map that they come out with. But I have two books on my shelves which are very cogently argued that says that one of the most corrupt places in the whole world is the city of London. Uh, these are massive books about it. All the details. And the point there is that corruption isn't necessarily illegal. It can be perfectly legal, but that doesn't stop it being immoral and unethical. So it is difficult to define, it's impossible to measure. You can't go and say, um, excuse me, are you corrupt? You end up with your concrete round your waist and over into the river. But it's everywhere, to greater or lesser degrees. And what is regarded as corruption is highly variable according to countries and peoples moral and ethical frameworks. But it connects with the black economy, which worldwide is about 20% of trade. 9% of that is drugs. The rest is armaments, people trafficking, uh, various kinds of vice, and so on. And uh, that came off the BBC News one day, whilst I was writing this. Anyway, there you go. But so we arrived finally at last. We got to the Sendai framework. We are in Sendai. Um, I wasn't there um, for the meeting, and the reason why was the previous November in Sendai, I'd had a massive heart attack. But I can tell you the Japanese health system is absolutely excellent. <laughs> anyway, there's a picture of Sendai. It's not a bad place, city of uh, probably about the size of Coimbra, actually. No, that's not, it's ten times larger, I'm sorry, it's a million. I'm not 100,000. Um, anyway, it, does, it looks quite compact, actually. But, you know, they're very small houses. Uh, so there we are, March 2015, they're all in Sendai, 6,300 uh, people. The university and the city host it, they build a new conference centre for the event. The framework is finally agreed at one minute to midnight before it's presented, or something like that. And there we are, we have a new framework, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction to remedy the defects that are now known and discussed of the Kyoga framework. Uh, much of that was hosted by Irides. Uh, there are some photos from their building, which is anti-seismic, on uh, seismic base isolators. Uh, they're good people at Irides. They're doing very good work, but uh, this is a problem beyond that. Highlights of the Sendai framework. What does it do? Well, 15 years, not 10. They have enough confidence that this will last for a further five years, 50% more. It does tackle things like health and human rights that were missed out in the yoga framework, but it doesn't give much detail. In part, that's because it has to be a fairly short document. Now, there's a word in English which is should. Should appears 16 times in the document. Should is the world's worst word. Now, we all should do things. As I stand here, there are things I should be doing all over the place. There's a list of hundreds of things I should have done already. But I haven't. So should is a word you have to be very careful of. Governments should reduce disaster risk. Must is a better word. Women, children, the elderly and animals are in the document. That's something. Gender was pushed for by Maureen Fordham, professor 
in the UK, uh, who is the leading expert on gender, and the Gender and Disasters Network, which I urge you to join, GDN. Well worth it. It's a big network. Minorities are mentioned, there isn't much detail. People with disabilities are mentioned, there's almost no detail. But they're there, at least. And um, therefore, the document is more focused than the previous one. That's something. It covers things that the Kyogo framework left out. And that keeps people a little happier. And it is a 21st century document. The Kyogo framework really wasn't. It was a 20th century approach based on 20th century disasters philosophy. It does at least think about other conventions, because the ideal would be to connect these things. There are reasons why that doesn't happen, but I think they would like to see it. It does have the idea of targets and monitoring. In other words, ISDR was preoccupied by the idea that in reality you haven't got some kind of uh, way of, if not enforcing, at least naming and shaming and saying, Vanuatu, you're not doing it like you should. Um, or something. But again, it's non-binding. It has no legal mechanism for enforcement. Governments can take it or leave it. By the way, this was a hospital. Um, actually, it's only a third of it. The rest is completely washed away in Japan. Anyway, the links with the other agendas are weak. And the reason for that is that the countries, their negotiators, would not sign up to an agreement where because the climate change framework was binding it forced them to do binding things in the disaster framework they would say we haven't got the resources we cannot afford that therefore uh, we don't want to be in default therefore we will not sign an agreement with binding clauses in it that's what they said and of course all the poorer countries want financial aid to do this and they don't get it there isn't any there are targets, but they're not very clear, although efforts are now being made to clarify them. I will say that for the way. And through the creation of various working groups, in fact, there are a lot of people working on the whole idea of targets and so on. So, as I say, countries are afraid of legally binding things. They leave money to countries, countries that haven't got money. Priorities and perceptions vary. Is this an important problem? Well, you know, I sat there in the UK expecting some kind of coverage of this event, and there was none. It was mentioned that the Prime Minister of Vanuatu was at a meeting in Japan whilst there was a major cyclone that devastated his country. He didn't even, didn't even say what meeting it was. It was extraordinary. In other words, in terms of the Western mass media, this event was not history at all. It was not anything. It wasn't even worth mentioning. Countries will defend their own interests. You cannot expect them to do differently, although they may make alliances with other countries. And in so doing, they probably suspect those countries' motives. And the trouble with DRR is it is a political optional extra. A few people die, a few thousand, a few tens of thousands of people die in a disaster, and it's still a political optional extra. You could do without it. You could say, well, my predecessor in this job, a prime minister, didn't do anything about it, and it's his fault, usually a him. Uh, or you can say, well, we weren't expecting this. We did not believe there would be such a large storm, earthquake, flood, whatever it be. And get away with it. So I sat there in a meeting in the Royal Society in London, a very grandiose place, and there were the top people uh, from the UN and other things, and they were droned on about it. And to keep myself awake, well, actually, I didn't need to. Outside, there was a West Indian steel band that energetically played the same tune on steel drums for two hours and a quarter. And that was actually the most interesting thing about the whole meeting, despite the repetitiveness. So I sat down and I wrote, some devil's advocate questions, and here are some of them. Um, do we actually need the Sendai framework? Can anybody convince me that this is necessary rather than a total waste of time? Uh, is it, if it is necessary, capable of reducing losses? 
We don't know the answers, by the way, but sometimes you just have to ask the questions and hope for the best. What about the wording? There's, you know, tremendous fights over the wording here. Slight changes in the wording. And the fact that it's still totally a top-down strategy, except for the Safe Cities Initiative. Uh, it was 21 times that they said should. Similar and um, in the event of the cure to damage ratio and disaster risk creation, is this meaningful, this process? For whom is science? You know, there, there's currently, there's a loss of trust in science. There's a loss of trust in experts and scientists. It's pervasive. It's not just Donald Trump, or it's not just um, the UK government. It's, it's very pervasive. And um, if governments are not transparent, legitimate, democratic, and so on, will any of this work? Is it dependent on having greater transparency and democracy? Globalization is the whole idea of a national government actually a bit of a waste of time. Are we all hostage to global forces? After all, they're capa they are capable of concentrating half the world's wor worth in 42 hands. And these people are considerably more powerful than many governments, perhaps even half of governments, if not the rest. The degree of influence in modern democracy is now so high, it is the dominant force by a large margin instead of elections. Top-down culture, is it unhealthy even? Is this telling people what they're supposed to want when in fact they have better ideas about it? So, into the future by way of conclusion. <laughs> what value does such an agreement have if it's not binding? Well, it's a consensus of sorts. That's something. In a world like this, it's very hard to get consensus. It's a framework. You could use it productively. It reminds countries that they are responsible for protecting their citizens, although there is legally much debate over R2P responsibility to protect, mostly in the context of refugees and migrants, but to a lesser extent, it also, well, in the same degree, but to a lesser extent in the debate, the debate applies to disaster reduction, protecting the citizen. It's an agenda for collaborating, that can't be bad. And at least they're trying to implement it and monitor that and set targets. Good. However, top-down DRR doesn't work. I think we have the proof of that in the studies that have been done. At least in my view, it doesn't. It does some good, but it doesn't solve the problem. And it never will. Countries easily evade responsibilities. Plenty of examples. Some of the worst from Myanmar, but not exclusively. It can't be policed. You can't go into a country and say, I accuse you. Come to the international court and go to jail. It's vague on details. It has to be because countries would not accept the details if they were any more precise. And it's poorly connected to the wider agenda because it was negotiated to be so by the countries so that that kept their responsibilities within limits in signing the Sendai framework. So then there's the question of whether the implementation through the application of science is actually acceptable to populations. I've actually had the privilege to go um, to this point here between the reactors. The radiation level outside my bus was the equivalent to 350 chest x-rays, although I only got one chest x-ray worth of, uh, of radiation um, as a result of uh, 50 minutes spent touring around this area from reactors three and four to reactors five and six. Um, but the whole thing was a matter of lies, cover-ups, and all sorts of stuff that devastated the relationship of trust between a coterie of engineers, scientists, and politicians in Japan and the Japanese public. But it's not an exclusively Japanese problem. So if you're going to study this and write your PhD on it, or you've already done that and are writing something else, the really exciting bits, in my view, are the connections between the different systems. I only managed to put five on the diagram, or it looks scrappy. 
But if you study the relationship between natural and social, organisational, political and technical, that's where the real challenges lie, I think. I'm um, sorry, I mucked that up. Go back one. Go on. There we go. Yeah. Sorry, it was a bit slow to respond. There we go. Last, last point, sustainability. What we actually need, we don't only need programmes that are locally based, we need them to be sustainable. Why do I need to say that? Because disaster risk reduction goes backwards. You put money into it, you take money out of it. I was part of a program in Lombardy in Milan, and uh, it was can that was the end. It was a great program, brilliant results, very very intelligent, and it was stopped. That's the end of that. What we need to do, therefore, is to have a sustainable DRR, which is part of the overall sustainability agenda, environmental sustainability, climate change adaptation, all the rest of it, not using resources unwisely. And all of that. So there you go. Final verdict on that is that if the Sentai framework didn't exist, it would still probably have to be um, invented. And we finish our journey back at the Cartoon Museum in Ishino Market. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I went on too long.